Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 13. Amen. Those of you who want to stand, you can stand with us. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 13, it's, it reads like this from the English Standard Version. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. The word of the Lord is blessed. You may have your seats. Amen. I love the word of the Lord. It is sweet to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. It is the lamp to my feet and the light to my path because the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. I would like to title our passage, uh, title our sermon from this passage this morning. I would like to title it, Let Freedom Ring. Amen. Let Freedom Ring. Help me, Father God. A man by the name of Reverend Jack Yates did something amazing with his newfound freedom just months after June 19th, 1865, Juneteenth. When the Emancipation Proclamation was finally enforced in Texas, thus forcing Texas enslavers to free their people that they were enslaving, Reverend Jack Yates let his freedom ring, such that it continues to reverberate to this very day when he decided to do something radical with his freedom. Instead of staying on the plantation and working as a sharecropper for the plantation owner who had formerly enslaved him, Reverend Jack Yates took his wife and 10 children and they moved north, north to Houston, Texas. That may not seem significant to you on the surface, but in the words of his great, great, great granddaughter, attorney Jacqueline Bostick, McElroy, excuse me, venturing out on their own at that time was the unknown and the unseen. They didn't know what would meet them when they got to Houston. But they, they by faith ventured out into the unknown and to the unseen, saying to themselves, I'm going to do this on my own. But Reverend Jack Yates understood the responsibility that came along with freedom. Freedom for him wasn't just a status for comfort and for safety, but freedom was used faithfully in his life. In fact, his move to Houston after Juneteenth wasn't the first time that he had leveraged his freedom so radically. Years earlier, Reverend Jack Yates was enslaved in Virginia, and it was there that he married his wife, who was enslaved in a neighboring plantation in Virginia. However, Reverend Yates' enslaver eventually emancipated those who he was enslaving on his plantation. But the owner of the plantation where his wife was enslaved decided to move to Texas to avoid emancipating the people that he was enslaving. So Reverend Yates, although he was free, moved to Texas, and he allowed himself to be enslaved again just so he could stay with his wife and his children. That may seem unfathomable to us today, but he was someone who did not take his freedom lightly. He let his freedom ring. And this is why after Juneteenth, when he and his family got to Houston, he did not just work to establish a life for the comfort of himself and his own family. But Reverend Jack Yates would begin to establish a community that would seek to help other formerly enslaved people build a life of legacy for their families as well. This community would eventually be called Freedman's Town in Houston, Texas. Over the span of just a few months, after Juneteenth, he would establish and found the first black Baptist church in Houston, Texas, called Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. And out of this church, Reverend Yates would create other institutions for his people to actualize their freedom. 
he organized schools, one of which was called Houston Academy and is now called Booker T. Washington High School in Houston, Texas. Another church he established was called Bethel Baptist Church. He organized efforts to purchase in Houston this park that is called Emancipation Park. And he helps us to support the work of establishing one of our HBCUs, Texas Southern University. It's clear that Reverend Yates understood freedom not just on a natural level, but he understood the implications of freedom on a higher, holier, and more spiritual level. He understood that freedom comes with responsibility. The way he let his freedom ring and what our passage this morning urges us to consider is what we do with our freedom is important. And what we do with our freedom is a good reflection of how precious we value our freedom. Because as all of you know, this weekend, our country celebrates Independence Day. But as I hope you also know, our community and our ancestors have always held this weekend in tension because in their Declaration of Independence, the founding fathers of this country, or as Maya Angelou puts it, these yet-to-be United States, they declared that the causes which impelled them to separate from England were this. They thought that these truths were self-evident, that all men were created equal, that all men were endowed by their creator with some unalienable rights, with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. However, these same founding farmers, founding fathers, were blind to the contradiction in their own declaration. They were declaring freedom from the oppression and the tyranny of England while oppressing and enslaving men and women on their own plantations. This was obviously a poor use of freedom. Freedom that was only used for self-advancement and self-aggrandizement. However, I believe our passage this morning urges us to consider how should freedom be used? Pray with me, stick with me. I believe we're going we're going somewhere. How should our freedom be leveraged? What responsibility comes along with freedom? In the halls of African American history, Reverend Yates is just one of many examples of people who did not leverage their freedom just for their own advancement and aggrandizement. We can talk about Sojourner Truth. We can talk about Frederick Douglass. We can talk about Harriet Tubman, and we can go on and on and on. But what we must remember is that those who have gone before us, they saw a cross section between their spiritual freedom that was bought by Jesus Christ and fighting for the actualization of their natural freedom here on earth as well. They saw that there was a cross section between spiritual freedom bought by Jesus Christ and actualizing their natural freedom from oppression here on earth as well. They understood that their spiritual freedom in and by Jesus Christ is inextricable from the pursuit of love, service, and the good of others. In fact, I believe it is reflected how truly they appreciated their freedom. I was watching a documentary that I learned of Reverend Jack Yates. And in it, the, the, the woman who marched around America in order for Juneteenth to become a national holiday, she said that she believes that from June 19th to the 4th of July, it should be a season of celebration of freedom. Because they said that um, in Galveston, Texas, after Juneteenth, that when the first 4th of July rolled around in 1865, that the blacks in Texas celebrated the 4th of July even though the whites in Texas did not because the whites thought that that was for the union. But the blacks said, we are going to celebrate our freedom even on the 4th of July. 
And what I believe that we must recover is this cross section because those, our ancestors, they understood and that's why they went to church afterwards because they understood that their freedom was not just something that was natural. But they were glorifying God to be the one who executed and brought their freedom about. There was this cross section. There was this intersection between the spiritual freedom that they had and the actualization of the natural freedom as well. This passage tells us what happens when we don't use our freedom well. Nudge your neighbor and tell them to wake up. Because I don't want us to miss it. This passage tells us what happens when we don't use our freedom well. Listen to what it says. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. This is what happens when we take our freedoms lightly. That's how we can live in a world where families are being torn apart. That's how we can live in a world that just this week, gun violence can break outside of a church after they have funeralized a loved one. A bullet going into the church. I saw the bullet hole myself. I was there. I saw it myself. I wasn't there when they shot, but I went afterwards. I was there. I saw it. That's what happens when we don't take our freedoms light. Um, when we take our freedoms lightly, what happens is that we bite and devour one another, and we are consumed by one another. What happens is that you see crimes from young people who are not even eighteen years old yet, because they're just thrill seekings, trying to find a way to get a thrill. It's what happens when those who are told to uphold justice will overturn laws that provide equity, such as affirmative action just this week. When we don't take our freedoms seriously. This is the world that we live in. And we need the people who know that their lives have been purchased and freed by the blood of Jesus Christ to be compelled to love and serve one another. If our communities are going to improve, if our households are going to improve, if your household is going to get better, if your marriage is going to get better, if your family is going to get better, if you're going to be able to see change in your community, if we're going to be able to see change in our church, we're going to have to take our freedom more responsibly. I believe our passage helps us with this. Because if we're not careful, we may take our freedoms for granted. We may take them lightly. And we may find ourselves bound again. Maybe not in the institutions that we were free from, but in new things that we are binding ourselves in over and over again. Matter of fact, I think that this passage, it teaches us some things. That if, if, that if we're not going to take it for granted, the first thing that we got to do is that we have to appreciate our freedom. We have to appreciate our freedom. Friends, Christian freedom is different. And because Christian freedom is different, if I can use the vernacular of our young people, because Christian freedom is different, it hits different. It, 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 it interacts with the world different because it is different. This verse, verse 13, is a turning point, a transitional verse in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia. And he says in it that he, he says, for you were called to freedom. And it, it, it marks this important transition from theology of freedom to now helping us to understand the responsibility of freedom. In the previous chapters, he has laid out the theology of freedom. He has helped them understand how it is that they are free and what it means that they are free in Jesus Christ. And one of the major problems among the churches of Galatia was that the believers there did not know what to do with their Christian freedom. 
So they were binding, bounding themselves, going back into Old Testament practices and laws because they did not know what to do with their freedom. They, like we, needed to remember that Christian freedom was something that they had been called to. Do you know that you were called to freedom? Amen. Saying that you were called to freedom means that you did not pick up the phone and call God and ask him for freedom. It means he knew your number and he knew your zip code and he came and he called you and said, I'm going to set you free. And guess what? You weren't waiting by the phone, waiting for him to call you and rescue you. You can take no credit for the freedom that you have. Freedom was not the result of some natural right of theirs, of ours. It was not the result of some product of human campaign for liberation. This means that freedom is something that we don't earn if we believe in Jesus Christ. It is something that Jesus earns for us, and through faith in him, he confers to us. They didn't earn it, and they didn't purchase it. There was nothing about their freedom, and there's nothing about your freedom in Jesus Christ that you can take credit for. So, too, we as Christians are free because God called us to be free. You were called to freedom. God, out of his abundant grace, goodness, and kindness, decided to call us. He decided to affirm us. He decided to love us. He decided to choose us. And Paul wanted to remind the church of Galatia, like I believe he wants to remind us, that this calling that we have, it is so important that we recognize that we have nothing to show for why we have received it. Because then we will appreciate it much more. When I use someone else's car, if I ask to borrow Sister Renita's car, Guess what I'm going to try to do? I'm going to try to take care of it. I'm going to take care of it better than I take care of my own car. If Minister Kevin were to allow me to drive his car, I don't know if y'all know what kind of car he has, but if you do, listen, if he were to allow me to drive his car, I'm going to make sure that I drive the speed limit, that I don't run over the speed bump too quickly, that I make sure I brake just in case somebody else cuts me off because I don't want to do anything to damage the car that he bought with his money, the car that she paid with her money because I didn't purchase it. As a matter of fact, when I get done with it, I'm going to put some gas in it and give it back to them a full tank and get it clean so that I return it to them better than they gave it to me. This is how we need to understand our freedom. We didn't buy it. We didn't purchase it. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. Christ bought it with his blood. He shed his blood that we would be free. And certainly we should appreciate what Christ has purchased for us that we did not partake in at all. This is something I'm trying to teach my children. Lord, pray for me. That when you get something, you should show appreciation for that which you get. There should be some sense of gratitude. Y'all saying amen because y'all thinking about my, how young people are so ungrateful these days. But do we take seriously what Christ has done for us? I don't think we always demonstrate we appreciate what Christ has done. His blood purchased our freedom. Do you know that when he died, not only, I know you know that he freed us from the penalty of sin, but do you know that he also is now freeing us from the power of sin? Amen. This is where you take notes. Yes, you know that he freed us from the penalty of sin so that we are no longer subject to the wrath of God anymore. We have taken on his righteousness such that we don't receive damnation like we should because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but there is a gift. 
So we have to remember that we've been saved from the penalty of sin, but we also have been saved and are being freed from the power of sin. This means that we can't just thank God for saving us from our, um, um, for the penalty of our sins, but we must thank God for saving us from sinning. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus Christ is. That the blood of Jesus Christ, when you reflect on it and you allow his spirit to get inside of you, he will help you say no to sin. You're still in this flesh and you think you got to say yes to this flesh. But no, now by the power of the spirit, you can say yes to God. You can say no to sin. That's what Christ's blood purchased for you and I. That we would be saved from the power of sin. I just wonder if there's anybody in here who could testify that God saved you from committing some sins that you knew had you not had Jesus, you would have gone and done anyway. Oh, yeah. Thank God for two or three witnesses. But I know I said it earlier, but I'm going to say it again. I was seeking deep in sin. And I needed somebody to come rescue me from the sin that I could not rescue myself out of. That I couldn't pull myself. I was trying hard to get myself out of the sin. But I needed Jesus' blood to reach not just to the highest mountain but to the lowest valley. To pull me up. And I don't know if there's anybody else but I thank God. That he has given me the power to say no to sin. There were some times I didn't have that power. There are some times that I did not say yes to him. But I thank God now I can testify I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. I'm here to declare to you my past is over. My past, I am pressing toward the mark. I ain't got it all together, but I know I got the power to say yes to Jesus now. That's, that's the power that's the freedom that we have in Christ. He frees us from the penalty of sin. He frees us and is freeing us from the power of sin. That doesn't mean that, that you're never going to sin again, but you know that through Christ, through his blood, it is powerful enough to help you say no to sin. And sin is still sin. I know we live in a culture where people just want to just just gloss over sin and, and decide what is sin for them and what is not sin for them. But God tells us what sin is. And since he is the author and the creator of everything, he gets to decide what sin is, not us. I don't know how I went on that tangent. But he frees us from the penalty of sin. He frees us and is freeing us from the power of sin. But the good news is that his blood one day will eventually and fully free us from the presence of sin. That's the freedom that we have in Christ. That as we put our hope and our trust in Jesus, that we know one day, if we continue to believe that he is the one who has saved us, that we continue in our walk and in our talk, show that we believe he is our Lord. Not that our circumstances are our Lord, but that Jesus is our Lord because he's the one that purchased us. He's the one that bought us. He's the one whose blood is on the check, signed his name on the check for our life. If we believe that one day he will free us from the very presence of sin as well. That's good news. That one day, we're going to be able to live with him in heaven. One day, we will see sin no more. 1 Corinthians 6.20 tells us that you are, we are not our own. That we were bought with a price. Colossians 2.14 tells us that Jesus canceled our record of debt that stood against us. He nailed it to the cross. In doing so, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities of this world and this age, and he triumphed over them so that we could have freedom. He is the one who did it. And when we appreciate our freedom, and when we understand that Christian freedom is different, it should hit differently. That's why not only do we need to appreciate our freedom, but we need to make sure that we don't abuse our freedom. Christian freedom is a liberty from sin, 
not a liberty to sin. Stick with me. I got good news, all right? Right now, we need to remember that Christian freedom is not a liberty to sin. It is a liberty from sin. Listen to what that passage says. It says, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. This does not mean that now that you have been set free and now that he has redeemed you, now that he has rescued you, that you can do whatever you want to do with it. No, it means not to abuse the freedom that you have. How many of us? Know people who got a little bit of freedom and they went buck wild. I ain't going to talk about nobody else. I'm going to talk about myself. When I went to the University of Pittsburgh in the fall of 1997, I got my first taste of freedom. And because I got my first taste of freedom, I realized after the fall of the next year, I needed to come back home because I let freedom, I, I started abusing the freedom that I had. My second year, my sophomore year, fall semester, I got this freedom thing figured out. I decided I was going to register for all my classes. None of them were going to start before 12 o'clock because I wanted to make sure I can do whatever I wanted to do the night before and still be able to wake up and go to classes. See, that was an abuse of freedom because that's what happens when we get a little bit of freedom and we abuse it. See, we have to understand that sin will entangle us. That's why Hebrews tells us to, to, to throw aside every weight, every sin that so easily entangles us. We need to know that sin ensnares us, that it traps us, that it forces us to do what it desires for us to do. That's how powerful sin is, and we cannot take sin lightly. But thank God that the things I used to do, I don't do anymore. And, and, and more of us should be saying this <laughs> because we can say yes to God in this stage of our life if we place faith in Jesus Christ, that he is freeing us so that we can say no to the flesh. But I want you to get this. When we experience true freedom, it sets us free, not just from sinning, but it sets us free from focusing on ourselves only. This is where I want to walk heavy because I got all the amens when I was talking about sin from the church folk. But do you know what the church folk will do? We'll just think about ourselves. That's why Pastor Tanya has to stand up here Sunday after Sunday and tell us it's not about us. See, when Paul says, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, he is not just talking about sin. He is also talking about using it just for yourself, just on what will make you comfortable, just on what will make you satisfied, just what would make you safe. He says that we are through love to serve one another. See, I have to ask you this question. Are you only using your freedom on yourself? Are you leveraging the freedom that Christ purchased for you to have to serve and love someone else? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 3 tells us that if, that if we give away all we have and deliver up our body and be burned but do not have love, we gain nothing. See, many of us, we, we think that we're doing all the right things. We're going through the motions, but is it truly from the place of love for one another? Or is it really for just myself? The question that this passage challenges us to consider is how are we expressing the love of Christ to one another? It says it three times in this passage. Through love, serve one another. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. It is forcing us to consider how are we using our freedoms, not just to serve ourselves, 
but to serve someone else. And what I believe that we need to consider this weekend is how the Lord wants to use the freedom that he purchased for you to love and serve somebody else. Because we can get real satisfied and comfortable in our freedom. And we'll just use it for our household. I'm glad that I got saved. And I'm glad that my household is going saved, and that's all there is to it. But what if Reverend Yates had took that position? That after he got his freedom, that he says, oh, I'm just going to think about my wife and my ten kids. We would not have Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. We would not have Booker T. Washington High School. We would not have Texas Southern University. But he said, I'm not going to use my freedom just on myself but I'm going to use it to help free someone else. I'm going to help use it to serve and lift someone else up. Isn't that what Harriet Tubman did with her freedom? She said, now that I've got my freedom, I'm not just going to sit on my laurels and my freedom. I'm going to go help someone else. And what I want to urge you on this morning triumphant, I said all of that to come to this point, is I want us as a church to figure out ways in which we can better serve our neighbors. I literally want you to begin sending me ideas of what we can do to love and serve our neighbors. I'm serious. I believe the Lord will give you creative thought, creative imagination to come up with ways we as a church can be more neighborly. How can we love and serve one another better? Or are we just going to serve ourselves? I know some of y'all, you were amen in the whole service. You were amen, and even when I was talking about biting to devour one another. And we do need to be careful because this is what this passage is really laying out for us is that if we do not use our freedom for good, we will abuse our freedom for evil. That if we are not using our freedom in a way that helps to bring about human flourishing for other people and good for other people, we will abuse our freedom. One of the first steps of trying to say no to the enemy and to say no to this flesh is to begin saying yes to God and what he wants you to do. Matter of fact, I'll prove it to you. In the next verse, it says, but I say this, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires or the lusts of the flesh. You have to begin walking out your freedom. And Paul lets us know in verses 13 through 15 that one of the ways we walk out our freedom is by fulfilling the law. In one word, love your neighbor as yourself. So often... We think about who is our neighbor. You know that there is a there's a church guy who came to Jesus and asked Jesus that same question. There's this expert in the law. He stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? He asked, How do how do you read it? And the guy answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will leave. You will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes on to tell him the parable of the great, um, the, the parable of the good Samaritan. And he tells him how there was this man who had been robbed, abused, and was sitting on the side of the road. And everybody else walked by him. Really, all of the church folks walked by him. But there was this guy who was not a church guy. He was actually the guy who none of the church people wanted to be around because he was a Samaritan. He was the last person that we should have learned something from. But Jesus says that this Samaritan stopped by this man who was on the side of the road about to die and cleaned up his wounds, put him in a hotel, and paid for everything. Jesus said to the crowd, Who do you think was a neighbor to that guy? 
Because the question is not who is our neighbor. The question is who will we be a neighbor to? So I want you all, this is, this is real application, y'all. Get out your phones. Email me. Y'all know my email address? Put it on the screen for them. I know you, I'm supposed to end with Calvary and, and hoop and hollering. But, but, but this is, I want this to be real practical because we live in a world where people are biting and devouring one another. And you want to know why? Because the church of Jesus Christ, who has been freed because Jesus purchased their life, only serves themselves when we have been put in this world to serve our neighbors. And if we, if we, the church of Jesus Christ, if we would not just answer to our own circumstances, but let Jesus be Lord over our life, if we could serve, we would be able to see the biting and the devouring of one another start to come down. We would be able to see that the way people are consuming one another, it will become to come down. You know what these young people who are looking for a thrill needs? They need someone to hug them. They need someone to show them that they care for them. They need someone to listen to them. It is our responsibility not to take our freedoms lightly. Yes, he gives us the power to say no to sin, but he also gives us the power to say yes to him and to be used by him to serve this dying world. That's the mantle that we get to carry. The black church in America, we are the church that preserved the true gospel. We're the church that looked at the gospel of white supremacists and said, you only talk about the slavery of sin, but you don't talk about the sin of slavery. But we in the black church, we understand that there is a cross section. Yes, there is the slavery to sin, but there is also the slavery of sin. And we will hold up a banner that uses, that sees both and uses both intention to understand that we thank God that he saved our souls. And we're not going to use this liberty to do whatever we want. We're going to use our liberty for the love and for the sake of serving and sacrificing for one another. I need your help. I need your help. I'm serious about this, y'all. Not only do I need your help with ideas... But I need somebody to help me with implementing and executing the ideas. Amen. Execution is not even in my top five strengths. I don't even think it's in my top 30. It's probably 32. <laughs> Y'all laugh, but I'm serious. I want us to get serious about using our freedom for the good, the service, and the love of one another that we would be able to be the true light and the true salt in this earth. God is calling you. God has called you to use you, not to serve yourself. He's freed you, not for your own self-advancement alone, but that we collectively would help to build communities like Reverend Jack Yates did, Freedman's Town, where Everyone in the town was able to flourish together. Y'all gonna help me? Y'all seriously gonna help me? I really need you adults to get serious about this with me. Because our young people are watching. They're looking to see, are we just gonna be about churching on Sundays? And I love good churching. But are we gonna be serious about being the church throughout the week? Are we going to be serious about being the voice of triumph in communities, heralding the truth that Jesus wants to save you, Jesus wants to free you, and I'm going to help him do it. Our children are watching us, and they want to see us live out this truth in our day. I pray that next year, 2024, from the 19th of June, to the 4th of July that we will celebrate freedom for that whole time. 
knowing that we are not just free naturally, but we also are free spiritually as well. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Thank you, God, for this time in your word. I pray, God, that you would use it for the good of your people, but for the glory of your name as well. We need your help. We stretch our arms to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.